team. I'm the one who sent you all of those emails encouraging you to register and come to this great event. So thank you, thank you for doing that. Um, the theme of this year's event is learn, explore, imagine. So if you've been to AVI Live in the past or an AVI hosted showcase, we've had a great show floor with a lot of manufacturers. This year we wanted to take it up one more level, make this conference more relevant to you, more useful, and have more takeaways. So that's why we're starting with keynotes. We'll follow this up with some seminars. Um, you can get CTSRU credits, you can get product information, you can get ideas to more efficiently run your business and more efficiently run your operations. Um, so we hope that you enjoy these seminars as, as much as we've enjoyed putting them together. If you have any feedback on anything that you've seen or you want to see more for next year, we are all ears. So anybody with an ABI logo on their, on their shirt, feel free to provide any feedback and let us know what else you're looking for. So our first keynote speaker is Brad Sousa, and he is our Chief Technology Officer at AVI Systems. Oh. <laughs> I get <laughs> <And> a van. <laughs> and he's coming right up. <laughs> How are you this morning? If you can hear me okay, say yeah, I can hear you okay. Yeah, I can hear you okay. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here with you this morning. So I'm Brad Souza. I'm our Chief Technology Officer at AVI Systems. And before I spend time talking about what our keynote is this morning, which is around this topic of emerging techno uh, technology or emerging trends, I thought maybe I might just say a welcome to some important people that are in the room. So if you're an AVIer here this morning, you work for AVI, would you just raise your hand? You're not that important. I just want to let you know. <laughs> The important people in the room, as much as I love you, and you know that I do, the important people in this room are really on both sides of ABI. On our left is our vendor partners that provide us great tools to work with on an everyday basis. And on the right are our customer partners that we get the privilege of joining and spending time solving some really important problems with them. And without our vendors giving us the tools to do it and our customers giving us permission to solve problems, we wouldn't be here. So if you're an AVIer, would you applaud both our customers and our vendors that are spending time with us today? Thank you for being with us. So the topic this morning is emerging trends. And every time I get in, I get, folks, I'll talk about this kind of stuff for, for hours, because this is where I live and I'm passionate about what's happening in our industry. And, I'll say to you right off the bat that I believe that this is the best time to be in the industry that we are in ever. And there's all sorts of reasons why now is the time to be in this whole visual communications, collaboration, AV space. Because for the first time, it's being consumed at a level that actually creates transformation and changes inside the companies that we support. And it's a very, very different marketplace than what it's been in the past. And so you're going to figure out real quickly, I'm very passionate about what we do. And I happen to believe that what we do is very relevant to how people communicate together, how organizations uh, share ideas and come to decisions together. Everywhere I go, there's a discussion around, Brad, what do you see on the horizon? What's the next big app? What's really going to drive what the industry is doing for the next few years? And there's going to be all sorts of technologies that you're going to see for the next two days. And there's going to be great seminars about specific technologies and why they're so amazing. But before we get into any of the bits and bytes and the geek talk, what's really relevant to me is to kind of establish a backdrop for our conversations the next couple of days. And the backdrop is really this. The single most influential shift, I believe, in our industry has to do what happens behind the eyes and between the ears of the people who use the stuff that we do every day. There's a big shift in how people, how humans are interacting with technology. And that shift is really fascinating. So I'm gonna start by painting a backdrop. And this backdrop, I wanna use a, a picture of something that's very unique. It's never happened before in the entire IT history. And this backdrop really sounds like this. For the first time, we have four or maybe five generations of people working in the same place, facing the same problems, trying to solve the same issues together. So in, in my company, in our company, ABI, it is very common for us to be in a meeting. I'm in a meeting with our chairman of the board. 
and he would be what we call a traditional generation. I'm a baby boomer. Our CEO is a Gen Xer. Many of the staff that we have and team players are all in critical roles and they're millennials. And how a traditional and a millennial looks at solving a problem or communicating together is wildly different. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. So let's say for the sake of conversation, AVI designs and delivers on a video conferencing or collaboration room for somebody. Now we do that every day, right? But how a, a traditional, a Gen Xer, a boomer, a millennial looks at that technology in that room and what their human response to what I want to do in that space is very different generation to generation. So uh, a traditional will look at the technology, walk into that conference room with a pad of paper, look at that technology and say, why do I need to use it? A boomer will walk into that room like me, well maybe not like me, but somebody from my generation would walk into that room, and they look at that technology and they'd say, hey, you know what, I think I know what that can do for me. But I don't understand it, so I'm gonna find a specialist to help me figure out how to dial that video call. A Gen Xer will say, I like this technology, so I'm gonna adapt the way I work. I'm gonna change my meeting so that I can use this technology and improve my life. And a millennial will walk into that room, look at the big monitors on the front and that funny looking touch panel on the table and say, that's way too complicated to get out an iPad and make the call on FaceTime. Doesn't matter what you spend in that room. It's very different. The perspective on technology is very different. How different generations consume technology is very different. And what that means for you and I is that we are at an awesome crossroad in our industry. That if we can get past the bits and bytes and really look at how people are consuming technology for the first time, it's very, very transformational. And that's the opportunity that I want to share with you today. Now, we're going we're gonna to geek a little bit. We're going to talk about some some technology shifts, but before we do, I wanna talk about this particular shift, which has to do with how people view and adapt technology on a multi-generational basis. Because in the past, we would say one size fits all. As long as I have the same basic technology in all my spaces, one size will fit all. But today I would say, can one size fit all? And the reality is, I don't think it can. I think that the, that the key winners in our business, the key winners in our industry are going to be those who learn how to deliver technology in a way that's easy to consume, irrespective of what your perspective on technology is. Now, does that resonate with you at all? Somebody, I know it's early, give me a nod, maybe, yeah, kind of, some of us are saying, yeah, that's probably the case. So with this backdrop about technology, let me then share this with you. We think from a, from a human adoption, technical consumption perspective, we think that there's really three core overriding trends that are shifting everything that we do as an industry. Here's the three trends. First trend is what I call, forget the technology, I want the experience. The second trend is what I call changing the way we meet and connect. And the last trend is the unexpected Skype disruption. Anybody here ever heard of Skype for business? Raise your hand, you've heard of Skype for business. So we're gonna talk about these three specific trends and how they are influencing design, new technologies coming to market, and how people are actually adopting technology. So let's start with this, forget the technology, I want the experience. The idea here, this is probably the single most important slide. If you wanna fall asleep, you can fall asleep after this slide, but this slide is probably the most important slide for us to talk about today. And it's on this concept that, in the past, we would design solutions by talking to an early adopter who had a fairly well-defined need and then providing a solution to satisfy that need. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But here's the catch. When you design to the early adopter as opposed to the knowledge worker, you never get the wide-scale adoption that you need. And as a result, there's not the transformation that could really happen. So while the early adopters are the loud voices that give us the ability to fund and look at new technologies and bring new solutions to bear, it's really the knowledge worker that creates the transformation. And so the designs and solutions that we come up with need to be facing knowledge workers more than they need to be facing early adopters. 
And that's not a simple task because knowledge workers don't care about technology. They care about getting their work done. So how do we make that human connection happen? So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. This, this idea of forget the technology, I want the experience. So this slide is a slide that's the result of a road mapping session that we did for a financial services company. And we came in and began to listen to their knowledge workers, how they conduct their meetings, what they do on a daily basis. What is it that you actually do? How do you arrive at decisions? Who's a stakeholder in your decision-making process? How do you connect with them and know that they're on board with the consensus that you're starting to build? And then we began, we began by defining different user groups and different expectations about how they want to meet within those user groups and communicate with each other. And then we begin to plot them on a, on a continuum like this. We call this the experience continuum or the meeting continuum. And if you look at this continuum down on this side, this kind of meeting is meant for you just to sit and receive information and absorb it. But up here at the top, it's really meant for you to interact with that information and with each other in an exchange, more collaborative. On this side, it's really meant to inform you. On this side, it's meant to entertain you. So hopefully, this discussion this morning is somewhere around the interaction, kind of over to the entertain. Okay, I'm not going to be too entertaining. Maybe over more the informational side. But the idea is that we want to be able to have different kinds of meetings and different user groups have different expectations of what this means. So we begin to plot it on this continuum, and what we learn is that there's there's actually, this may look like chaos, but there's actually three different meeting styles. There's a meeting style that looks like this, which is about inform informing people. There's a meeting style that's about interaction and collaboration, and there's a meeting style over here that's around um, sales and external engagements with people outside the, their company. So, okay, that's interesting. Here's another matrix that we look at. This matrix has to do with scheduling versus ad hoc conversations, and this has to do with who drives the technology. Do you have an operator? Like this morning, I have some great people back at the sound desk that are operating all of this for us. Or is it something that's self-directed, that a knowledge worker is gonna try and make the call or run the technology on their own? Now, these two axes are very significant. We are in a series of meetings um, recently with a company, and we asked the question, when you have a problem, how do you solve it? Now, that sounds pretty, mundane, right? And they would start off, well, we just talk to people and get it. Okay, so what if that person you talk to is not in the same building as you? What do you do then? Here's what we learned. We learned that their first, in their culture, their first method of solving a problem is walking down the hall to find somebody to talk to. The second thing that they do if they can't find that person is in their head they start recruiting. Who can I think of that's going to help me solve this problem? And then the next thing that they do is they get on a phone and start trying to find that person. We ask them, do you have any collaboration software that you guys use? I said, yeah, we actually counted it up. They had 26 different collaboration platforms that they used. WebEx, Skype for Business, GoToMeeting, all of that, 26 different ones. And we said, maybe what we could do is identify the top two or three that you want to use, enterprise-wide, and wouldn't that help you connect to somebody that might have an answer a lot faster? Because in your culture, when you can't find that person, you schedule a meeting, and now all of a sudden you're treating an urgent problem though it's not urgent. We're gonna wait till tomorrow or next Thursday to get to this. Yeah, you know, that's really an interesting idea. So the concept here of being able to understand what the experience or expectations of our users are really looking for really drives this whole idea of adoption. So now that we get that, what do we do about it? Here's the three things I would encourage us to think about. So as you're looking at technologies today and tomorrow, I would encourage you to think about these three things. Number one is, what can I do to automate the experience? In other words, okay, for, so if you're an AVI person in this room and you're a programmer, cover your ears, so we have these great touch panels in our conference rooms. My opinion is, is that the best touch panel is no touch panel. If I could walk into the room and the system just somehow intuitively knew what I wanted it to do and could somehow do it on its own, wouldn't that be the best experience ever? 
but we're not quite there yet, right? And so the idea is, what can we automate to, this, to take off the need for some human to make a decision about the technology? How do I make the technology more transparent to the user? And we can do that through automation. Walk into the room, plug in a laptop, turns on the system, routes that to a display, and all of those exchanges that used to take some human to poke out a button on a touchscreen someplace, those things go away. And that creates more, a more intuitive adoption of the technology. So the second thing is, is workflow adoption. So workflow adoption has to do with what do you normally do to create a meeting? Most people use something like Outlook to create a meeting. And what can we integrate into Outlook to automate this? So here's, this doesn't, this is, I promise you this is not Big Brother, but here's the kinds of things that we think about. We think about things like Brad walks into a conference room, maybe there's a Bluetooth reader that recognizes my phone, my Bluetooth profile off my phone, or maybe I have a badge because I have to badge to get into the facility and I swipe my badge as I, as I run up next to the room and it recognizes who I am, plus all the other people in the room, and compares that to the meeting invite in exchange and says, so this is a meeting in this conference room that Brad reserved the room for, so Brad must be the host. So here's Brad's calendar, and we're gonna display that now, and so on the screen says, Brad, you reserved this room for an hour, tap this to start, and it knows that it's a Skype for business call, or it knows it's a video call, or a WebEx call, and it launches that on a single touch or because it knows that I'm present in the room, it does it on its own. That's the kind of thing we're talking about with workflow. So let me kind of expand that, take it one step further. So um, in the not too uh, distant past, one of our healthcare providers said, hey, we have a problem we'd like you to help us solve. And the problem was labeled as emergency department workflow optimization. Sounds like AV, doesn't it, to you? Here's the problem they were trying to fix. Um, with population-based health, you can only have so much of a wait period in your emergency room. Now, I know that none of you believe that because the wait in the emergency room is way longer than we think it should be. But the idea is that when you have more, uh, more people lined up in that queue, then eventually you have to start sending people to a different facility. And so what they wanted to do is create a separate queue. They wanted to, at, at the time that the patient presents, they want a technician or a, a, um, a patient nurse to be able to determine, is this an emergency or is this just an urgent situation? And then offer the patient, would you like to, uh, you can wait and go visit an emergency doctor if you like, or you can just see a doc because you have an earache and you can probably do that over video in, a, in less than 30 minutes. They're using a patient record platform, Epic or Cerner or whatever it is checking that patient in, they don't want it, that knowledge worker doesn't want to have anything to do with video. So our mission was, how do you take that interaction that they do in that patient record platform and automate the video call from the doc that's doing the consult to the exam room that the patient's sitting in? Record the, who talked to who and for what duration and update the patient record. That was our mission. That's workflow integration beyond just looking at outlook and how people meet together. That's the kind of thing we're looking, in, looking for. Because at the end, it's all about knowledge worker adoption, not early adopters consuming the technology. Because when knowledge workers consume it, we can create a fundamental shift in how an organization goes about solving problems and working together. Make sense? So, forget the technology, I want the experience. Here's some things we'd say to look at. Focus on shifting technology from the bits and bytes to how it's being consumed. Recognize that our buyers are moving from being technologists to technology buyers. Um, so my example is uh, I go to the Apple store and buy my, my phone because I know what CPU's in it and what iOS it's running and all of that kind of stuff. My wife goes to the Apple store and buys a phone because she wants to do Facebook and make phone calls. She could care about what's inside the, the phone it just does a function for her. So she's a technologist buyer, or a technology buyer, I'm a technologist. And our, our customers are shifting from technologists to technology buyers. We need to be looking at uh, how to support spontaneous and ad hoc meetings, not just scheduled meetings. 
And we need to be looking, about, looking at how we integrate workflow and work product, which is large data that we work on together and develop together. Here's some nice data just to think about. So here's the second trend. The second trend is changing the way we meet and connect. So here's what I mean by this. This is how we used to meet. We used to meet <clears throat> by gathering people in places around a period of time. So I'm going to do a video call, as an example. At 2 o'clock, I need you to be in this room, and you to be in that room, and I need you to be in that room, and we'll somehow all magically connect. <clears throat> but that's not the way we meet anymore. The way we meet is more like this. And the idea is that I might have a team in one office and a team in another office, and they're working on stuff together, and they might have a scheduled meeting for an hour. But as they're talking through their work product, they need a somebody, a subject matter expert, to enter into the conversation for 10 or 15 minutes and then get out. This ability to ad hoc add people and drop people to meetings is really critical to shortening the mean time to decision making. It's critical to creating knowledge worker adoption. The issue is how do you know where that person is and how do you connect them in? So there's a lot of stress now on creating unified collaboration platforms that don't care where you're at. I'm on my iPhone, I'm on my laptop, I'm in a conference room, I'm at my desk, it doesn't matter. We need to just be able to identify, do you have five or 10 minutes? And if you do, you're brought into a meeting. So in ABI's culture, it's something like this. I see Tom Melms, our VP here in Chicago. So let's say I need, I'm having a conversation with one of my team members and I need to talk with Tom about something. So my next thing is I am Tom, and my I am is two words, two letters. It's hi, because that's the shortest way I can say, are you available? If Tom responds to me, hi back, yeah, hi or hello, then I know he's got time for me. If he ignores me, I'm not offended, I'm on to the next person because I'm recruiting busily in my head who can help me solve this problem. The I am, that I am goes immediately to a video call in our culture right afterwards. The idea is, is that we want to be able to connect people on demand. And to do that really shifts and changes the way we integrate technology. So this used to be, or it still is today, what a lot of AV companies would look at and say, these are our systems, right? I have a boardroom, I've got maybe a, a cafetorium, I've got maybe some collaboration spaces. But we would say these are not systems. These are actually nodes on a bigger system. And these nodes need to get connected to core business applications. They need to be connected to our exchange databases. They need to be authenticated in Active Directory. They need to be integrated with our voice platforms. They need to be transparently connected across my entire enterprise so that no matter where I'm at, what facility I'm at, I have the ability to connect as long as I have time and a device in my hand, share the same information as I would if I was in the meeting room with you and as a result of that, drive to a decision faster. So I would guess that most of us in this room, when you look at a slide like this, this resonates with you. We're just not really sure how to get there. Would that be true? I mean, if this, if this is resonating with you, some folks in the back, if this is resonating with you, give me a nod. Is this something that you hear or talk about or people are asking for on a regular basis? Sure. The question is, how do we get there? And how do we do it in a way that's simple enough that people don't have to learn it, they can just use it? <clears throat> so this whole notion of um, the visual enterprise is really what we're trying to drive for. And if we can find a way to bring these together, and we've been doing that now for, I think the first time we actually did this, AVI was in 2010, on a link platform when we brought Microsoft's Cisco, Polycom together all in the same environment and was able to start collaborating on demand. This technology is emerging to the place now where it's commonplace for us if we can figure out how to integrate it from mobility on one end of the spectrum to conference and meeting spaces on the other. <clears throat> so, how we connect. Number one is our spaces and design ideas really need to be about mobility and how to bring mobility not into the space, but into the discussion. It's about connecting teams and people together, not just rooms. And if we can find a way to do that um, in a manner that's simple and easy to adopt, it's gonna create shift in our organizations and drive forward business decision and acceleration of our businesses. 
So here's the last thing, and then we'll take some Q&A at the end. The unexpected Skype disruption. Now, I wish I could tell you that I was smart enough back in 2010 when we did that first integration to look at Microsoft Link, now Skype, and say this was going to really shift the way the world communicates. But quite honestly, I didn't see it to the extent that we see it today. Skype is really an interesting phenomenon. So it is right now in the, in the, in, in the conversations that we have with customers, it is probably the single most consistent topic that we are talking about with customers today is what do we do about Skype? How do we integrate Skype? Today, many reports state that Skype is equal with Cisco, and Cisco was the dominant brand on collaboration. But today, most CIOs, VPITs, are weighing both. And I would go so far as to say that the, most statistics indicate that well over 100 million users are on Skype for business today. That's really pretty amazing when you think about the fact that Skype, is only, Skype for business has only been around four years. So over 100 million users in four years is pretty significant. Now, whether you like Skype or not is not the point. The point that I'm making is that Skype is a unexpected disruption. And what we wanna do is figure out what's the beneficial part of this disruption to help us move forward. So we believe that Skype has been so significantly adopted for a number of things, but here's some of them. Number one is it's the first time it's democratized video. For years, the video conferencing industry, I'll say myself, have been talking about, man, when desktop video conferencing takes off, man, when desktop video conferencing takes off, you just watch out when desktop video conferencing takes off. And it never took off. Why? Skype took it over. And it's democratized video. Let me give you an example. Many of our customers before Skype would be doing somewhere around two or 3,000 conferences a month, video conferences a month. Skype plus video, 25, 30,000 conferences a month. An order of magnitude greater consumption. That's significant. <clears throat> it plays into this open workspace concept. It drives us away from just using appliance-based video conferencing to software-based video conferencing, which enables us to build small huddle and team spaces in a cost-effective way so that we can adapt to this open concept of, a, of a office planning. So here's a drawing of how we see it often working. So in this particular case, what the end user wants to do as a knowledge worker is they wanna just have a meeting, schedule a meeting using Outlook, and as a result of that, have people join the meeting irrespective of where they're at. So in this particular case, this particular customer has a Cisco UCM voice platform. They've got Skype in O365 in the cloud. They've got a um, version of a hybrid um, Active Directory environment, so they have some Microsoft on-prem, and they've got a Polycom video infrastructure. And with that same meeting invite, users can click to join, they can dial a conference ID and join, they can be in a conference room and tap to join, or they can be somebody that's not even part of the network and join either through Federation, through PSTN dialing services, or by dialing the conference ID at the domain of the customer and join the meeting in the same way. So I can connect with supply chain, I can connect with customers, and I can connect with everybody irrespective of what platform they're on and share information back and forth. That's pretty significant, and we see this concept being repeated over and over again today. It's one of the biggest trends that we see. Now I'm happy to get into the, into the details of how this works in a separate conversation, because I'll geek for an hour on it, but the idea is that we actually can have this, this um, kind of application that is adapted by the knowledge worker on an, on an ongoing basis. So, <clears throat> what do we do with all of this? Here's three questions I would have you consider as you're talking with vendors looking at technologies over the next couple of days. Number one, have a planning framework that allows you to knock down silos and focuses on use cases and user experiences. So if you don't have a, a planning framework that allows you to focus on the user experiences, we probably should be thinking about how together to develop that framework for you. Otherwise, we become very siloed in the technology and they don't interoperate or integrate with each other. 
The next thing is we need to be talking about ROI, return on investment, and we need to be talking about ROI. Why are we even doing this? What drives the outcome that we're looking for? Why is a user even interested in using this technology? And when you combine ROI, return on investment, with ROI, here's why this is beneficial for you. Your adoption and your return on investment almost double has been the pattern that we've seen. So this particular example is a two and a half million dollar a year over three year investment with this large enterprise account. And they're um, looking at around $16 million a year in return on investment because they're focused on not just ROI, but also ROI. And the last thing here is Make sure that we have the right analytics and reporting platforms to not only provide the kind of monitoring that we need and help desk support, but also have the analytics that we need to back up the cases and claims that we're making about utilization and return on investment. Man, you guys have been really quiet now and I've been really talking. Here's what I'd like to do. So I'm gonna ask you just a simple question. This concept of focusing on how users consume, the knowledge worker consumes this technology. Does that resonate with you? Just raise your hand if that's something that you say, you know what, that makes sense to me, it's something that we talk about. How about this, this whole thing around Skype? Does that resonate with you too? Is that a conversation that you find yourselves in on a fairly regular basis? Yeah. So I'd love to have, I'm gonna be here. Um, I'd love to have a conversation anytime you'd be interested in it. But let's open it up to Q&A right now. Are there specific questions you would like to ask? And I'll be happy to do my best to answer them in the next five or 10 minutes here. Any questions? Yeah. Hold it there and talk. You got it. Can you uh, speak about some of the specific uh, case studies or examples? Of sure. You really pulled this together. And sure. It's just worked brilliantly? Yeah, I'll be happy to share maybe some things that have worked, maybe some things that haven't worked, right? Because our belief is sometimes you win and sometimes you learn, right? Um, so I can't, I can't give logos because these are typically under NDA, but so we have a financial services company. This company happens to be an insurance company, a global company. And um, their initial ask was, uh, how, how do we create a connection for people who are not necessarily in the office? How do we create a meaningful ROI? And how do we improve the recruitment of a millennial demographic? That were their three big asks. And when we sat down and went through a roadmap session with them, and, and quite honestly, we were talking with the IT team. So they believed out of the gate, we don't need to do, we know what we want, can't you just deliver on what we're asking? And uh, not meaning to be rude, we said actually no. If you want it, it, there's lots of other companies that can deliver what you're asking, but we, we're not sure you're asking the complete question. So we asked them for permission to spend some time doing that and they were gracious to give it to us. That resulted in a design of five basic standard conference rooms from a huddle room to an executive room. That then, and those standards are global. That also then uh, architected a, a via voice with Polycom video and uh, then linked now Skype um, on-prem deployment. Um, and they're doing somewhere greater than 30,000 conferences a month and they're only at about 40% adoption. So we think, and, and their ROI, our best uh, calculations are that their ROI is somewhere around $12 million a year and they're investing somewhere around three to four. So that's a pretty significant shift. One of the things that they did that was really clever, um, so we started this engagement with them before Microsoft came out with a Surface Hub. And so they created with us a, uh, a proprietary skin that goes over the front of uh, some of their touch screens. And in some of their conference rooms, we don't have any codecs at all, they're just PCs that are operating. And you walk up, you see your calendar, you tap to start. The PC is locked down in a kiosk mode, so it functions as an appliance. And that tap to start thing was revolutionary to them. And for the more complex conference spaces, um, they don't have a typical kind of touch panel like you would 
I want this source to this display, or I want to get the video conferencing codec and dial this number. Um, there's a three-step wizard that they go through. What kind of meeting do you want to have? Is it just in this room where you connect it to others? Would this be the people you're trying to call? And you answer yes or no to those questions and it configures the room for them. Those kinds of changes seem may, may be pretty subtle, but they've made huge, huge shifts in knowledge worker adoption. That's been a good case. We've had some really difficult challenges too. And one of the challenges um, happens to be around Skype where Microsoft, we have Microsoft friends in this room. I want you to hear that I like you. Uh, Microsoft has done a really good job teaching their customers download it and install it yourself. And that's great unless you have a synchronous communication platform like voice or video. And so when you download it and build it yourself, that works until you get about 500 to 800 users. And then somewhere past that to 1,200 users, it starts really struggling. And so we really drive or recommend what's called the Skype Operations Framework to help um, streamline that a little bit better. And those customers that don't do that um, really struggle and it, it does not adopt as well. So there's a, there's a success and a failure. Thank